When I started out, the math involved with game development felt really intimidating. It wasn't just me, many of my colleagues felt the same way. But the truth is that a lot of the math that game developers use is a lot simpler than it looks. So let's break down the core concepts that game devs use the most and see why they're nowhere near as scary as Wikipedia makes them look. Let's start with the biggest bang for your buck technique, linear interpolation. This simple little equation, a plus b minus a times t, is deceptively powerful. The power comes from the fact that a and b can be anything. I can fade something in using lerp. Then I can move this guy to another spot on the screen and shrink it by lerping the position and scale. And what we lerp can be virtually anything. In this case, we've got a health bar, and we can interpolate the amount of health. We can interpolate the color as the health drops. It's really open-ended. And a straight lerp may not be exactly what you need. You can see that the movement here isn't awesome. So a powerful tool to change this is shaping functions. In the middle, we can apply a smooth step shaping function to the t parameter. Or we can optionally apply a more exotic shaping function, like this bounce that you're seeing here. More advanced users can even transform the inputs. So if we're looking at this gradient here, you can see some sort of reddish hues right in the middle because we're interpolating RGB colors. But we don't have to interpolate strict RGB. We can say change to another color space like HSV, which gives us a different look, a different gradient. If we try another color space, OK Lab, you end up with a gradient that is, in my opinion, more aesthetically pleasing. But not everything can be interpolated so easily. If you're making a game and you've got this little turret here and you want to swing it between two different directions, in the naive case that works. But in other cases, you can see that it fails to take the shortest path. To understand that better, you, as a game developer, should know what angles are. Let's begin with two lines. So here they are, and this opening here is called the angle between them. So angles are a unit of measurement for how big this opening is. Now in most daily life settings that you run into angles, they'll be expressed in degrees from 0 to 360, because reasons. But in math settings, you'll use a different unit, called a radian. If we take this unit circle, which is a circle of radius 1, and start from here on the x-axis, and we walk one unit of distance around the circle, this forms an angle of one radian. Angles by themselves are useful, but even more so when we can do math with them. So this brings us to trigonometry, and it's nowhere near as complex as you might think it is. So to start, trigonometry is the study of triangles, and the relationship between the sides of those triangles and the angles in between. For me personally, I find it easiest to start with what's called the unit circle. That's a circle with a radius of 1. And it's pretty insane the mileage you can get by just knowing a few simple relationships. If we take some point on the circle, it forms this angle here called theta, and this right angle triangle. You already know that the radius is 1, so the hypotenuse is length 1. Then sine of theta is this vertical distance here, and cos of theta is just this distance here on the horizontal. And finally, tan theta is, well, if you extend the line from x equals 1 upwards, and the line forming your hypotenuse, they meet up here, and tan is this distance here. As you move this point around the circle, we obviously expect cos theta, sine theta, and tan theta to change, and we can graph those changes. So sine theta kind of bounces back and forth between 1 and negative 1 as this vector rotates around the circle, and cos theta does pretty much the same thing, just slightly offset from sine of theta. Tan is kind of neat. You can see at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2, tan theta is undefined, kind of flies off the screen. And now that you know what tan is, well, that freakout makes perfect sense, since you can't compute those values. Amazingly enough, just these few simple relationships cover a shocking amount of what game developers typically need from trigonometry. Look at this frog here. We can animate various properties of it trivially with trig functions. Modulating the scale by the sign of the time gives you this pulsating effect, while adding an offset to its height, which is the sign of the time, gives you a hovering effect. Spiraling and orbiting type of movement is achieved easily by calculating the x and y coordinates on the circle, which, as you saw earlier, is super easy with cosine and sine. Once you combine trigonometry with a basic understanding of vectors, it becomes an even more potent tool. And vectors aren't too difficult to understand either. 
You have your little dude, and he's located at some coordinate in the world. Well, that coordinate, his position, that's a point or position vector, let's call it P, which in this 2D case is simply a pair of numbers, an XY coordinate. This little dude might also have a velocity, which is just another vector. But in code, we'd be careful to use it differently from a position since they have different underlying meanings. It kind of helps to distinguish between position vectors, which represent a point in space, and vectors that represent a direction and magnitude. These tend to just be called vectors. So you got these two distinct sort of usages, but they're really easy to work with. Add a position to a vector to get an updated position, useful for moving things around. Add or subtract two vectors together to get an updated vector. This could be force or velocity or whatever, useful for accumulating forces. Subtract a position from another position to get basically a vector telling you how far away one is from the other and in what direction. Multiply a vector by a scalar value to make it longer or shorter, useful for scaling things like velocity by time. Add two positions together to get nonsense. This isn't a thing that makes sense. So let's see it in action. If I want to displace this point, let's say it's heading in this direction and the total velocity is this vector, and we'll scale that velocity with the time passed to get where to move, and that gives us where the point should move to. So the new position of the player is this velocity vector multiplied by the time and then added to the position to get a new position. Now the velocity, that also needs to be updated. So here's the velocity of the object, and this velocity vector Maybe there's an accelerating force, or gravity, call this A, which we multiply by the delta time, and that's the new velocity. And just like that, we have Euler integration, an imperfect but super simple and easy way to compute movement. Look up for that integration if you want a more stable way. Among the many advantages vectors have, one of the most powerful for us game developers is the dot product. So given two vectors, and we're going to use unit vectors in this case, which are just vectors with a length of one. So if I have two vectors and we draw the unit circle on top, then we just chop the vectors off so that their length is exactly one. We know that if one of those vectors, b, lies on the x-axis, then this distance on the horizontal here is simply cos theta, or basically cos theta equals a dot x. If we expand this out further in terms of the full vector a, then cos theta is equal to a dot x times 1 plus a dot y times 0, or cos theta is equal to a dot x times b dot x plus a dot y times b dot y. This is called the dot product. So given any two unit vectors, computing the dot product gives you cos theta, the cosine of the angle between them. Seeing it with b on the x-axis just made it easy to visualize. And the dot product is friggin' awesome, because it gives you this simple way of determining how aligned two vectors are. As they get closer in direction, cos theta approaches 1, whereas when they're perpendicular, cos theta is 0, and when they face in the opposite direction, you get negative 1. So the math is neat, but what exactly does this buy us, as game developers? Let's imagine a turret, which shoots at stuff. Pow pow pow. Now, some character walks in front of the turret. We need to figure out whether this is in front or behind it. You have the turret's forward direction, which is this A hat forward. And you have this vector to the guy, which is B hat to guy. A simple dot product, and check the sign, and voila, definitely in front. But if we move this guy behind the turret, so he kind of moves over here, you can see at some point the arrow goes red. Or more advanced, Let's narrow the field of view of the turret to 60 degrees. Well, cosine half of that, 30 degrees, is roughly 0 0.866. So we calculate a normalized vector from the turret to the player, compute the dot product between the turrets forward and that direction, and compare that to our cutoff. And we can figure out whether it's visible or not. Of course, now that this dude is fair game to shoot, we might need to rotate the turret. And for that, you'll need to be familiar with matrices. Matrices are these big blocks of seemingly random numbers that you somehow do math with. But what do they mean exactly, and is there any way to understand them better beyond just blind trust? So the first thing to do is to start seeing matrices as linear transformations. Imagine a grid with an x-axis as 1, 0, and a y-axis as 0, 1. Those two vectors, or basis vectors, define the space. 
Now, if we wanted to say stretch out this grid, making it wider and taller, how do we do that? The stretched version of this space has x at 3 and 0, and y at 0 and 2. So we'll take those vectors and just dump them into the matrix as columns like this. Now when you multiply vectors by this matrix, you'll find that they get stretched out horizontally by 3 units and vertically by 2. And we can define other matrices similarly. Let's say that I make x here, like 0, 1, and y is negative 1, 0. What does this do? Well, we can see that the matrix is just 0, 1, negative 1, 0, which is just those two basis vectors, which, when applied to any vector, does a 90 degree rotation. So let's draw our unit circle again. And we know that if we have a point here, we can easily define it as cos theta sine theta. Let's make that our x axis. Then our y axis is just theta plus 90 degrees, which is over here. Well, then magically, we just figured out how to make a rotation matrix. You're probably more familiar with this version, which is what you get when you simplify it. They're not really all that mysterious at all. And to cap things off, what if the two axes aren't at 90 degrees? Well, I can define x along here and y along in this direction. In this slanty effect you get, this is what's called a shear. And why am I talking about shears? Well, we already know that our 2x2 two two matrix can rotate and scale just fine. Yeah, that's super easy. But how do we translate? None of these operations maps to a position. Well, we can kind of cheat by using another dimension. If we have a secret third dimension, z, and any point we define, like say this point here, is actually located at x, y, and 1. So by adding this new dimension, we are now working with what's called homogeneous coordinates. Then we can define our rotations and scales as normal, and in this z column here, we can tuck our translation in. What happens now is when we apply this matrix, look what happens. The origin moves. This transform, which looked like a shear earlier, is kind of being abused to handle translation instead. This extra dimension lets us use a single matrix to handle everything, rotation, scales, and even translations, all at once. This gets us into the topic of representing rotations, which is something you, as a game developer, should familiarize yourself with. The problem with storing your rotation as matrices, though, is that, well, first of all, if it's a 3D rotation, that's 9 values, which is just a lot of data. But more than that, if you try interpolating between two matrices, that's going to get you into a world of trouble. You can see here, as we try to interpolate this monkey from start to end position, it kind of freaks out a bit. People have made stabs at this in the past, but it's difficult to get right and just really complex. I remember when this was posted and the pretty significant criticism of the article. Another common way to represent rotations is Euler angles, and many games will expose these in UI. They're basically yaw pitch roll, or rotations around each axis, applied in a fixed order. They're awesome. They're compact having only three components. They're intuitive, since they align closely with, say, how an airplane works. And you can quickly get a feel for what the numbers mean, but that's where the advantages end. You can't interpolate them easily. If you do a naive interpolation, like you're seeing here, you can kind of see that this gives results that really aren't ideal. More than that, unfortunately, they suffer from something called gimbal lock. Now, gimbal lock is easy to understand once you see it in action. So you've got these three rotation axes, and they have to be applied in a fixed order. To visualize, we have this object and these three rings around them. They're the rotation axes, or gimbals. So we rotate around one, we're doing the blue one. You can see that spins the model and nothing else. We follow that with the rotation of the green ring, and both the model and the interior gimbal, the blue one, they both rotate. Finally, the outer ring rotates and it brings everything with it. The problem arises when you use this ordered method of applying rotations and accidentally line up two of the gimbals. If we rotate the green by 90 degrees, look what happens. The red and blue gimbals are aligned now, and no matter how you rotate either of them, you've lost a degree of freedom in your rotations, which sucks. That's not to imply that games don't use them. They totally do, because they're simple and easy to understand. So any user-facing stuff will probably be using Euler angles. But deep in the darkest parts of the code, ideally you have a representation that's compact, intuitive, immune to gimbal lock, and can interpolate smoothly. Fortunately, there's a solution. Unfortunately, they're called quaternions, and they give you three out of four of those things, which is about as good as it gets. 
They're compact, requiring only four values. They're immune to gimbal lock, assuming you don't build them from an Euler angle and expect magic. And they interpolate smoothly, as you can see here. We've got the original matrix and Euler angle interpolation, and to compare, here's the quaternion version called spherical linear interpolation. As you can see, it's much more what you'd expect. Quaternions are these mathematical objects that we can use to describe rotations in 3D space. They consist of a scalar, or real value, and three imaginary values. From that description alone, you probably get the feeling that these are going to suck to understand. And you'd be right, they're hard. A lot of people have tried to simplify them, make them intuitive, or give you ways of visualizing them, but at the end of the day, they're just friggin' hard to understand. If you're one of the chosen who gets them, awesome. If it's any consolation, even as a graphics programmer, I've only had to know how quaternions actually work precisely once in my career, and predictably it was in an interview. But just because they're hard to get any intuition for doesn't mean that you can't at least sort of understand why they work. Let's backtrack a bit and start with complex numbers, those weird things you learned in high school. You know, square root of negative 1, i squared equals negative 1, etc. So we'll start with that, because in math you can invent your own rules, and if they happen to be useful, then yay. So we'll consider a number line, and then extend it with a second set of imaginary numbers. So you've basically got these two axes now. Under normal circumstances, you'd call this x and y, but for now we're using real and imaginary. So then, every number has two components, one real, one imaginary. So 1, 0 would be written as 1 plus 0i. And of course, if we plot a point up here at 0, 1, that's written as 0 plus 1i, or realistically, just i. Now, you can do some interesting stuff. Let's bring back our point at 1, 0. Like, what happens if you take this point here, 1, 0, and multiply it by i? Well, that results in i times 1 plus 0i, and that equals to i plus 0i squared, or 0 plus i. Or in other words, we just did a 90 degree rotation in this two-dimensional real imaginary coordinate system. What if I multiply by i again? Well, then you end up with negative 1 plus 0i, or negative 1, this point over here. So at this point, it should be somewhat evident that multiplications are kind of like rotations. So we'll bring back our unit circle, and if I pick a point on it, and we know that's cos theta sine theta, then this point up here is represented by the complex number 1 plus 1i. So we'll multiply these two complex numbers together. So 1 plus i times cos theta plus i sine theta. And that's equal to, well, you can read all of that. But the final result should be cos theta minus sine theta plus i cos theta plus i sine theta. Now we compare that to a matrix multiplication. Well, you know the matrix. That's cos sine negative sine cos times 1, 1. And what you end up with is cos minus sine for x and sine plus cos for y. You get basically the same thing, right? So back to quaternions then. They're pretty similar, but extended with three imaginary components and a bunch of crazy rules surrounding how you simplify the terms if, say, you multiply i by j, for example. Okay, this one is just needlessly complicated. Here's a version that's a lot simpler. I said simpler, not simple. This isn't some rigorous explanation, but hopefully you at least feel like, yeah, I kind of feel like I could understand this given deeper study. And that's really the point of this video, that math can, on the surface, be a little scary at times. But in reality, most of the concepts aren't super hard to understand or work your way through. If you find yourself wanting to take that next step, I've packaged up all the math a game developer might need into an easy-to-follow course. It's designed to make these concepts simple and approachable, so you can start applying them right away. It's nowhere near as hard as you may think, and with time, many people can master these mathematical tools, which may be all you need to build a fun and interesting game. At the end of the day, that's what many of us are trying to do. What you may find is that once you have a basic understanding and the confidence that you could advance, suddenly topics that seemed out of reach can become accessible to you. And if courses aren't your thing, no worries, there's plenty of resources online. You can kind of piece together a lot of this information from various sources. Personally, I like Three Brown, One Blue, Freya Homer, and George Rodriguez's stuff. They're all great starting points. Cheers.